Welcome everybody uh, to our panel about the challenge and uh, how to diversify your funds based on like what happened in 2020 and uh, the COVID-19 crisis. My name is Isabella. I am the executive director of the Talk Project. I will be the um, I will be the facilitator of this panel. I have uh, other panelists here with me that I will be introducing, but really quick, I wanna say that, um, just to give a, a short introduction about the panel idea in general, uh, many organizations from the internet freedom community had challenges regarding fundraising in 2020. Not only uh, did we have to face effects of COVID-19, but we also had, saw like a, a sharp decrease of individual donations, um, in-person events that we used to raise money start to be canceled. Foundations start to change priorities to respond to the challenge of the pandemic. And uh, you know, uh, beyond that, uh, we from the internet freedom uh, community also had to deal with the fact that the Open Technology uh, Fund uh, suffered a big attack of the temporary administration, uh, blocked all of our their funds, and uh, many of us had contracts with them. So the goal of this panel is to share our experience on how we managed uh, to diversify our funds in 2020 and to overcome this challenge. Uh, our panelists are Katarina, who is responsible for developing relationships and raising funds from foundations, individuals, companies, and other sources. Before joining EDRI, the European Digital Rights, in December 2016, she had over a decade of fundraising experience, primarily at Greenpeace Central and uh, Eastern European Amnesty International in Slovakia, post Belgian SK and the Slovakia uh, Fundraising Center, which she co-established and has been the deputy chair since 2009. She holds a master's degree in film and television production and managed from, uh, management from the Academy of uh, Performance Arts in Bratislava, Slovakia. We also have Sergio Lida, who does fundraising and UX design at TELS. Uh, TELS is a portable operating system that protects against surveillance and censorship. We have uh, Ali Smith, who is the TOR project fundraising and comms strategist uh, for uh, TOR. TOR mission is to advance human rights and freedoms by creating and deploying free and open source anonymity and privacy technologies. We also have Dimitri, who is the funding director of Equality, a Canadian-based digital security nonprofit, leading the uh, Deflect the DOS mitigation infrastructure to and the peer-to-peer -peer censorship circumvention browser protection projects. Um, he has 15 years of experience working on digital security and privacy technology with civil society, human rights, and independent media organizations previously working with the Frontline Defenders and Tactical Tech Technology Collective. Dimitri had led and participated in security focus missions to over 40 countries and was a founding member of the NGO in about security edition project. So why don't we start with each panelist taking, talking about the projects and then we will open for our questions and have more of like a conversational mode type of interaction. Um, Katarina, do you mind being the first one to jump in and share a little bit? No, no, I can start. So hi, everyone, and greetings from Bratislava, from Slovakia. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here with you today. And thank you, Isa, so much for inviting me and for this opportunity to join the, this session. And I'm very much looking forward also for the discussion. So I will first sh shortly comment on the year 2020. Uh, how it was for EDRI. I have to say that the year 2020 treated us well. Uh, we exceeded our uh, fundraising goals and for the first time in our history, we also exceeded uh, income of 1 million uh, euros. However, it is also necessary to say that uh, this was reached mainly thanks to the cooperation with foundations, which are our long-term donors, and they are with us and supporting, has been supporting, have been supporting Edri for years, um, such as Open Society, Ford Foundation, or the Dutch Adesium Foundation. 
and also some more recent donors such as Luminate or the Civi Civi Civitates, which is the philanthropic initiative of 22 funders. They are based in Belgium. So uh, thanks to these corporations, we have quite a few multi-annual grants, which are which were not only reaching to 2020, but they are also reaching some of them to, till uh, autumn 2021. So this basically gave us some more uh, security. And thanks to this, um, we exceeded actually the fundraising goals. Um, later this month, we are publishing our annual report. So I have now uh, the final inc uh, income numbers. So to comment a little bit on the structure of the income, we uh, had last year, 75% of our income came from foundation grants. Then we had 9% uh, from uh, corporations. There was over 6% from membership fees. Edri is at the same time, uh, we are also a network and we have 45 member organizations which are based primarily in the countries of European Union and they pay membership fees. And we had 4% of income came from individual donors. So as it is often a case with advocacy organizations, I know uh, you can see that we are highly dependent or we remain uh, highly dependent on the foundation grants. So we are constantly basically rethinking um, how we can increase the income from the other sources. Um, when it comes to corporate fundraising and the membership fees, there are certain limitations. I can maybe talk about it a little bit uh, later, but we would especially like to focus on increasing of the income from the individual donors. As Isa mentioned, um, I worked for over 10 years for Greenpeace Central in Eastern Europe, so I have a big uh, trust and I really believe into the power of individual giving. And as you can see, we are only on the 4%. Um, one of the reasons also is that EDRI existed for, for long years without the fundraiser. So I'm the first fundraiser in the organization. And during the first years, um, EDRI focused mostly on the fund, uh, foundation fundraising. So uh, we started to uh, take certain steps um, in 2020 um, to increase the income from the individual uh, donors and uh, we are already seeing the effort is mostly, the fruits of this effort uh, is mostly visible now in 2021. And we took different steps from implementation of CVCRM, um, more systematic work with individual donors. Uh, one of the strong moments was because one of the key ingredients for the, for the fundraising success from individual donors is of course communication. And in 2020, we strengthened our comms team uh, in EDRI and also our campaigns team. And this is really a major help for me as a fundraiser. We started to do more testing. We took a decision that from this year on, we will do uh, two intense acquisition campaigns uh, to find new individual donors. I should also mention that uh, we are going to launch um, fundraising from cryptocurrencies. We would like to start with it from uh, September on, uh, also with the support from the Tor project. So that's additional. Thank you for you, Isa, for your, for your help. And um, I would also like to mention that um, I managed to convince my ED, although we had, it didn't take much convincing, but the system in Greenpeace was, we always got fundraisers a small budget uh, every year, like four or 5,000 euros to test something new. Uh, there was like a no obligation attached to it that uh, these 5,000 euros have to, or 4,000 euros have to return back. So we would like to try some uh, new things in 2021. Um, for example, I would like to explore the possibilities of uh, non-targeted advertisement, since it is against ethical principles of Edri to buy targeted advertisement and to track down potential donors or our donors. So uh, maybe that was about the individual donors um, with, um, I would maybe also mention that uh, foundation fundraising, of course, remains important for us. And um, we are trying to reach some more diversity also within this income group, because most of our funders are from the United States. And we would really like to increase uh, the number of the European donors. Of course, the challenge during the pandemic became um, it 
became really difficult to reach out to new potential foundation donors and to start a cooperation. We were not successful on this field uh, last year, maybe this year. And yes, there are different reasons behind it, but we have observed foundations started to focus, of course, on a stabilization of their existing grantees that we have seen, of course, that we are experiencing this with our own foundation donors as well. Um, a lot of funds were redirected to COVID-19 response, of course, foundations are thinking strategies and yeah, there are like more reasons behind it. So we will see how it goes um, this year. And yeah, as last thing, I would maybe mention the corporate fundraising that we have uh, our ethical fundraising policy. Uh, according to our ethical fundraising policy, only maximum 30% of our yearly budget can come from corporate partners, but we, are, we, ne we have never exceeded 10% in our history. Um, and here we would also like our main co corporate partners are uh, Mozilla, uh, DuckDuckGo, we received some smaller contributions from Apple, Twitter and Microsoft. And here we would also like to increase um, the number of uh, European corporate, uh, corporate donors. So maybe the very last thing I would like to mention is that uh, last year, of course, we started to think more about the financial resilience. And uh, last year we started to build our reserve fund. Before um, we didn't really have it. And one of the main reasons was that for a very long time of the existence of EDRI, we had project funding. And of course, from the project funding and also the income from sources such as individual donors and membership fees were lower, which is typically the income you can use for building the, uh, the reserve fund. Uh, but last year, uh, we started to build it. Our ambition is uh, to have three to six months of the operational reserve. And I think this is also very important uh, thing, uh, very important moment in the, yeah, the fundraising strategy. Thank you so much, uh, Katarina. I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, you share. I have a few questions, but I will drop them later. Uh, Al, do you want to jump in uh, and share a little bit as well? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Al. My pronouns are they, them. I am the fundraising and communication strategist at Tor. And I'll start in a similar way and share a little bit about 2020, which, as we all know, was not easy. Um, and the tour project is not excluded from that. Uh, basically, around the time that US COVID shutdowns started happening, we saw a pretty extreme drop in individual giving. Um, you know, I have this chart that I look at on the dashboard and it's humming along, humming along, and then all of a sudden just drops in a really scary way. And that combined with small foundations that we had been talking with who hadn't necessarily funded us yet, but who had signaled that they were interested, they basically said, yeah, we're, we're not going to be making any more grants for all of 2020. We need to see how this goes. We need to see how our financials pan out. And then um, similarly, we saw larger foundations shifting their giving to COVID-19 efforts or to stabilizing their existing grantees. So all of these things kind of <clears throat> combined into a pretty scary scenario. And that was on top of Tor coming off of a relatively difficult financial position to begin with. You know, we had just started getting to the point where we could begin rebuilding reserves and we could, you know, be looking towards the bright future. And uh, this hit us at a pretty, pretty hard time. And because of that, we had to make the, the really difficult decision to lay off a third of the organization. And that was um, that was really hard on all of us. You know, it's not just COVID, it's not just the economic impacts, it's not just lockdown, but it's also losing these really incredible people and teammates and needing to maintain these contracts that we have with funders with a much more limited staff. And that was hard. And it was really clear that we had to raise money maybe in non-traditional ways in order to stabilize and to bring back um, bring back our staff capacity and that required some that required looking outside of the the normal 
fundraising streams. Um, and then after all of this, you know, OTF, everything that happened with OTF went down. And yeah, it was just, it was a scary time. So I want to talk about three positive things now that we've gotten the dark stuff out of the way. Um, some successes that we saw in 2020, one being that we launched our corporate membership program, uh, the TOR project membership program. So in the summer of 2020, we want, launched this formal program that allowed corporations and for-profit companies to give to TOR. Um, we had always had relationships with corporations and several had been giving to us for years, including DuckDuckGo. And we were open to you know, uh, financial support from the sector, but we didn't have a formal way to engage. And it really depended on them approaching us and us saying, oh, I guess that sounds good, let's do it. Um, so we created this program as a way to be able to formally pitch to companies. Um, you support internet freedom, you care about privacy, you can demonstrate that by making a financial contribution to TOR. And you can also get the benefit of being part of our community and we will help you integrate TOR into your products. We will help you think about privacy in general. And we've seen a really great success with this, far more than we budgeted for in 2020. Um, it really helped us bounce back from what was happening that year. And, um, you know, we were not alone in creating this membership program. There are a lot of other organizations who have forged that path. So I really have to give credit to everybody who consulted with us and gave us ideas. Um, and I would be happy to do that, do the same for others. Um, another thing that we did in 2020 was really ramp up our community events. Um, we got some excellent fundraising guidance from a consultant who Media Democracy Fund paid for a couple of years ago, and her name is Beth Group. And she really emphasized for us that we needed to engage our donors and, and um, contact them in ways that we're not asking them for money, uh, to bring them closer and make them feel like they had an opportunity to be part of our community, even if they weren't involved in the day-to-day -day with TOR, um, that they would be able to see what was happening and get excited about our work. So we started sort of two streams of events, one being Priv Chat, which is an open public event series that's free that anybody can come to. And we bring together panelists from the human rights, internet freedom, privacy worlds, and just talk about what's happening uh, in, in the sector and how Tor plays a part of that work. And we invite everybody from our community to attend. And we use this as a special opportunity to reach out to regular donors who may only hear from us once a month with our newsletter. Um, and we've also started private webinars, which are an opportunity to invite our major funders, our members, our um, uh, foundation contacts, and, and anybody we maybe are prospecting with. And these are small private exclusive webinars where we show them what we're cooking at tour what's coming up next what's exciting and this is again another opportunity to engage people tour works in the open we're an open source project if you wanted to find out all this information it's there but a lot of our funders don't have the time or are not able to be day-to-day -day involved with tour so this is just a way to help them feel like we care about them knowing about what we're doing and help them understand what their funding is going towards. And it's been really exciting and we've gotten a really positive, positive feedback from that. And it doesn't result directly in a donation that day, but I think it, it helps people feel more connected and they often will come back to us and say, hey, that thing that you shared with us on the webinar, it made me think of this. And it just like builds this more connected atmosphere of our funders and supporters. And the final thing I'll talk about is cryptocurrency engagement. So I think a year ago or maybe two years ago, we started accepting 10 different cryptocurrencies and we've seen just like such an astronomical increase in support from the cryptocurrency community. And 
that was just by adding the ability to, you know, copy and paste our wallet address and send us some cryptocurrency. And this year we really started to engage with the community in a different way. And we rooted that in our values, like which kind of cryptocurrencies value privacy and human rights and are working towards similar kind of things. Um, for example, we've been talking a lot with Zcash and we had a small grant with them last year and we just announced a really exciting big grant with them from the Zcash Open Major Grants Committee. Um, thanks. <laughs> uh, for a project called Arty. And this project is gonna make Tor stronger. It's gonna make Tor more sustainable. And ultimately it will also allow Zcash developers to implement Tor in their technology and it will bring more privacy to Zcash users. So we're seeing these partnerships really like we're having financial success there, but we're also seeing that it's advancing our mission and in, in bringing privacy to more people and to everyone who needs it. So that's really cool and inspiring. Um, there are so many other things I could talk about that were exciting this year that I would not have expected that at the beginning of 2020. Um, but I am going to turn it over to Saljalita because I know that you guys have been doing some really cool stuff at Tails, and I'm excited to hear more about that. Yep. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm not going to talk much about Tails because it doesn't really matter, like what tool we are um, providing and stuff. Uh, but for us, uh, relying on donations from individuals and from users has been a, like, a very important pillar of our fundraising strategy in the past. And I think now we've reached like 30% of our budget is, uh, comes from individual donations. And um, we have a very small team. We, we don't have a, a, a staff dedicated to fundraising. Like I'm doing fundraising, uh, but I'm doing other things that days as well. So we are always very cautious about how we use our time. Um, and from past experiences, we learned that our time was better spent on structural improvements. So improvements to the donation process, improvements to the donation page, improvements that we can reuse from one year to another, than on communication and more ephemeral work, like events, Twitter, blog posts and stuff. I mean, it also comes from like our limitation as a team, but that's, that, that's all part of our strategy. And so what we decided to do uh, in 2020 was to apply um, UX design, so user experience design methodologies to the donation process. Because I mean, of course, uh, UX and usability is good to serve your users and to have more users, but it can also be uh, the same methodologies can be used to, to attract donors and to make them more happy. Uh, and from the work that we did, uh, like these are all ballpark estimates but I estimate that the work that we did um, last year brought us 20% more money and 50% more uh, individual donations. So I'm gonna overview very briefly the methodology that we use. So it's, it's a very usual design methodology. We did some user research, and then we did some prototyping before launching anything that we test and iterate um, uh, with the help of uh, users. And we also reviewed like best practices, best uh, practices in terms of fundraising and donation pages and stuff that are available on, on the internet. So we started doing this user research um, that we did uh, through a, a survey. So we sent a survey to what, they, what, um, what is called lab donors. So people who donated to our organization uh, in the past, but didn't donate last year. So kind of lost donors, you know? Um, I'm going to pa be pasting some links so you can have uh, notes on our process. I'm pasting notes in the chat. So there you have like the, the survey, the questions and the results. And so like what we wanted to learn through the survey was uh, what motivates people to, do to donate to Tails. And so we learned that, that donors are um, most of the time users themselves, but they're also users that want to help others. You know? There is like giving back, but also giving back to the project and giving back to other people who might not be able to, to donate to Tails. We also wanted to learn uh, what, what is their vocabulary, like how they relate and how they talk about our products. And for example, we found that uh, the, the IDF protection was, was, was very big among um, past donors. And so we built on that. And as you said, Al, um, previously, we also wanted to learn like what kind of relationship we can, uh, we can build with them 
what can what else can we do to to make like this relationship stronger and for example just like you said like people were saying okay we want to learn more about the project we want to have more frequent updates um on the life of the project but not only to ask us for money like maybe to make us feel like we're part of something huh? So that was the, 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 the research that we did. And based on this research, we started prototyping, um, prototyping texts and prototyping images. So I'm going to give you another link where you can see all our, the nifty details of our work, if you're interested in some of that kind of stuff. Um, and so, yeah, based on the survey, we said like, okay, the idea of protection is, is quite big. The idea of helping others is also quite important. And also like Tails is kind of unique and kind of maybe the most secure operating system or something like that, no? And so we ended up um, framing our message as Tails is their strongest protection. So, I mean, it's just an example to show you how we use the survey to frame and to frame our message and our images. And so once we had this prototype, uh, we didn't want to launch before, the, uh, before testing it with people and iterating on the on the on the prototype that we did and so we asked out uh, to friends uh, friends in the internet freedom community uh, we wanted people who already knew tales uh, who could be donating themselves but who were not part of our team because we wanted like kind of honest feedback no and so the way we did that we showed them our prototype text and our prototype images and uh, you should avoid um, ask, asking them whether they like it or not, because they are going to say, yes, of course, I like it. <laughs> but rather, you want to ask open questions to try to, um, to understand how they understand your text, how they understand your image, how, uh, how they see the strengths and the weaknesses of the different texts and different images, and whether they have any ideas on, on how to improve it. And so you can see on, on the last thing that I posted, we have different versions of different image, different uh, IDs and stuff. And we really use the feedback of these people to decide which way to go. And actually that's super, super cheap. We did that only with four people, 30 minutes each. And, um, and between each uh, interview, we, we would uh, improve uh, the text, improve the images. And uh, also related to something that, that, that you said Al before, I think like, it's very important to consider uh, like making a donation as a, an emotional act. So for us, it's key to observe people and to understand how, how they feel about your product, how they feel about your message, how they feel about your images, and to understand why they are feeling this way, no? Because one way, and, and you can't do that only with numbers. I mean, if you wait until the end of your donation campaign to see if your message was successful, it's too late, no? You need to kind of know that earlier and understand what's going on in, in mind and um, yeah so we did these rounds of uh, prototyping uh, feedback and iterating um, I'm gonna paste the links to the, the pages that we created through this process as well in the chat and another part of our work was also to review best practices because actually I mean all NGOs in the world are asking people for donation and there is already a lot of literature already a lot of best practices that you can like that you can learn from and implement in your own work. For example, the, the two main takeaways is that people are like the most important things when asking for donations on your website is making clear what's your mission, what's your goal, what's your work, what's your impact, like what you're trying to do and whether you're achieving or not. And also how donations are used. And uh, something we learned uh, reviewing this uh, literature is that um, it's a bit counterintuitive, but actually giving more information leads to more donation. No, sometimes we say, okay, uh, we shouldn't overload people with info. But actually, when people are wondering whether they donate to your organization or not, they want uh, access to, I don't know, how you use your money, um, what's your impact in the world, what's your missions and stuff. So uh, when we're designing our donation page, we also try to make this information available without being overwhelming. So you can layer the info and stuff. And for us, it's a very important way of like building trust and yeah, being transparent about well, like your work and, and your results. And in terms of impact, going a bit, uh, going back to these numbers. So um, I think that the, the, the work that we did last year, we invested a bit of time and money into it, but I think we, we already uh, returned on the investment three times. I mean, these are like world podcast estimates. And uh, the, the key thing for us is that it's, these are improvements that are gonna stay 
that will be going to be useful next year. And next year, we can continue improving and continue doing better every time, you know? And, and, and especially for organizations with like very limited fundraising resources like us, I think it's a very, very critical strategy. And that's it. Thank you, Sajorita. Thank you for the links. Uh, Dimitri, do you want to share a little bit about your project? And then uh, I have some questions that people want to answer. Uh, want to ask? <laughs> Sorry. Sure. Hello, everybody. Uh, so yes, my name is Dimitri Vitaliev. I'm director of Equality. Uh, we've been operating since about 2010. We're a digital security nonprofit with headquarters uh, here in Montreal, but staff kind of all over the world. We're about 25 people now. Um, I guess our annual revenues are between one and two million, depending on the year. Um, and yes, last year we were also part of the uh, kind of fallout from uh, OTF and suspending its programs for a few months. Unluckily for us at that moment, all of our programming received OTF support. So everything ended uh, from one day to the next. And uh, that was quite an emotional day. Um, but we persevered and we were lucky enough to actually continue without having to reduce um, our clientele. Two kind of major lessons that came out of that experience and that continue to this day that I would like to share. One of them is short and it's been mentioned already, I think, by Katerina, and that is a uh, safe for a rainy day. You, know, you never know when that's going to come. And uh, three to six months, I think, is a, is a privilege to have. Uh, we're usually, you know, one to two months uh, of funding to cover the whole team and have had to use it twice now. So definitely have it there because, yeah, you never know what's around the corner. And then the second lesson is to diversify your revenue streams. Um, but this time I'm going to add something to this panel by introducing a commercial alternative of your product or service. So I'd like to concentrate on that and kind of uh, why I think this might be a good idea and quickly the lessons learned. Even though uh, you know, I believe that commercialization is a bit of a anathema to a sort of a, a false and a human rights focused community, uh, but nevertheless, it could work, and uh, you could make it work whilst keeping your principles and your mission intact. So this is primarily based around the the Flex service, which is kind of our flagship um, service. It is a DDoS mitigation infrastructure. Um, around 600 clients, around a million people going through the network every day. So we've had, uh, you know, the opportunity and uh, the privilege to develop a robust infrastructure and mitigation tooling over the years without having to incur debt or to selling off parts of the company. Um, we saw that the product could stand on its own feet now in a commercial market. Obviously, we were buoyed by you know, the funding gap. And we have always uh, thought about long-term sustainability. So this is why we kind of ramped up a lot of the efforts that were being planned and being scheduled, you know, really ramped up to launch a commercial offering. And yeah, there was a lot to be learned along the way. You know, I didn't even expect how much we had to restart some of the things from scratch. Now, I'm sharing this with you because I believe it could be relevant to many other nonprofit uh, technology and other specialist uh, initiatives or groups that you run. Why? Well, uh, first of all, because uh, the problems faced by our target users and the existence of often sophisticated adversaries forces us to be extremely diligent in our service and product design. Also because our interest in uh, transparency like open source development and our focus on privacy leads to solutions without hidden secrets, without pitfalls, without compromising. I think uh, that is important in, in, the, in the long term of 
product stability and uh, market acceptance. Another interesting thing is because we've always had kind of, you know, nonprofit limited resources, in, when you compare that with commercial sort of startups, it forced us to create solutions that were cost effective. Even as we design and provision a global infrastructure, we can do it in a way where money is not the solution that underpins the success of our performance. And then something else I found is that possibly even bigger than various internet freedom funds out there, and not possibly, but quite surely, are numerous government programs to support and sustain small business. A lot of these are ramped up because of the pandemic around the world. They are particularly focused on startup. They're particularly focused on technology organizations. This is the case in Canada, but I believe uh, it is more or less, you know, uh, a global reality. Many countries want their technology sector to flourish, well, to, to be established and then to flourish. So many governments around the world are investing in small business. They give you help with marketing, with business strategies, you know, with exporting your products to other countries, even though on the internet, you know, we always, we don't even think about export, but it actually is, you know, if you have a user in a different country, you're exporting a product from your country to the third one. Um, yeah, there were lessons learned, but I, I'm, I'm over the five minutes, so maybe I'll save them for questions if they come. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I feel like uh, this is a great venue because it's such a diverse, you know, group of organizations uh, and diverse set of like uh, approach. But I feel like I want to start with one question, which is uh, I believe it to be an equal challenge in whatever strategy you, you're going, which is um, a little bit of what Katarina mentioned that they have uh, ethical fundraising policy. And uh, I was wondering about that, right? Like when you're making these decisions, being either like uh, by uh, creating a membership program or individual contributors, or, you know, like you will get certain types of offers or certain type of like uh, approach for a relationship uh, as well. Uh, as well as like, uh, right? Like opening up uh, for uh, more uh, for a profit business, like. Uh, uh, is that a line that you drown? You know, like do you keep some type of the business uh, for free for people who cannot afford? I want to talk about ed ethics, right? Like as you're making these decisions uh, for your organization, and uh, yeah, like whoever want to jump in and talk a little bit about that, uh, please feel free to <laughs> to jump in. And uh, if you thought about it, if you have, uh, you know, uh, what are the things that you would like to be investing on more? Uh, policies on that in your organization or overall concerns as you drive these decisions. <laughs> Even in the methods, yes, let me jump in. Yeah, yeah, I'm fresh from talking, so I can keep talking a little bit more. Um, so yes, we wanted to do this as an alternative to the nonprofit offering. The nonprofit offering is still first and foremost. That clientele has to remain. And the idea is that eventually, uh, or hopefully, profit from the commercial alternative drives the revenue not only to support the commercial alternative, but to support the nonprofit one. So first and foremost, we're still very much focused on our existing clientele. And we wanted to do this whilst keeping the same ethics and the same principles that brought us here in the first place. It is possible, you know, it is possible to have both you know, nonprofit activist clients and business clients operating to the same terms of service and to the same privacy policies. There might be challenges, you know, from, uh, you know, let's say the, the business world not expecting this kind of content restrictions or whatever that we would expect from our um, activist clients. But I believe uh, a lot of them do understand it. And it is beginning to be a uh, niche. Although I think it is still a problem that, you know, let's say human rights concepts don't necessarily or easily carry over uh, to the internet. And uh, very much so uh, to, let's say, a commercial customer. But they're beginning to thanks to efforts, you know, of uh, uh, 
uh, groups in this panel and many others of you watching and in general, I think uh, these principles are beginning to become part of uh, commonly held beliefs. And I think this paves the way for nonprofit organizations to kind of open up their, their focus um, to include customers that might help them survive in the long term. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody want to jump in as well on this question about ethics and the, as you're building these strategies and making these decisions? Maybe I can comment uh, on Edri. So um, Edri is an advocacy organization. So of course, the ethics in fundraising is very important there. Um, we have existing uh, fundraising ethical policy. I will, uh, I'm uh, adding the link to the to the chat where you can have a look. Um, it's basically ethical policy, uh, which has been already there when I joined Edri, and uh, we are actually currently working on updating it and to make it uh, more specific, especially with regard uh, to corporate donors. Um, I think one of the most important things which is related to ethics in fundraising is also to be transparent about the donors. Therefore, we always um, report about our corporate donors in our annual report. Um, you can find them uh, listed on our website in the funding section. Uh, the only way of accepting donations from, uh, from corporate funders in our case are unrestricted donations. Therefore, no conditions, no strings attached. So this is um, how it works. That's great. Thank you for sharing the link. Um, if nobody else, I can jump into another question because there's uh, like more things that people want to know. Uh, and I will combine one from the chat, which is about uh, the balance of like day to day work as you're launching uh, a project like this, right? Like you have to maintain, like you have to prepare the project, you have to launch it and then maintain it, right? Like uh, Sajalita was talking about continuous interaction, you know, like uh, I also was speaking about, uh, and everybody a, a little bit about engagement, right? Like with your audience and building this audience, finding this audience, right? Like, um, um, I, I guess like my uh, question goes into investment decision in the matter of like your time, you know, like it was worthwhile I invest on this uh, to do you know like uh, the money that came back in and also i feel uh in comparison with uh, just full-time doing grant proposal right like i have to balance this with other uh, ways of raising money if it like uh, because all this is smaller you know like organizations or even like medium size might be afraid of like doing that uh, capacity like i don't have the time you know like whatever like kind of thing i also want to ask um, if you can talk a little bit about tools and uh, you know, like other types of resources, because I think it's not easy. We have uh, all different types of uh, restrictions as we do this type of things, right? Like, uh, so I feel like if you can share a little bit more about uh, tools and resources, but uh, first if it's worthwhile, you know, like how, how you plan for such a uh, for investment of your capacity, you know, like in, in, in creating yet one more <laughs> way of asking for money and managing right, like project. Who wants to talk a little bit about that? And tools, if you wanna share, what, what are your two kits for the work, the fundraising you do? I just wanna echo what Sajalita said earlier is that there is such a huge amount of <clears throat> research on what is successful in fundraising that's available out there. Um, you know, not all of it is very, very specific to the internet freedom community, but there is a body of research around human rights fundraising. And we don't have to recreate the wheel, apologies for the idiom, but like there is a lot, there are so many resources out there that we can use and apply that information instead of trying to start from scratch. And I think that that is such an important thing to consistently remember is to look into that existing material and then to iterate over time, right? Like how does this general principle work? And then how can we make it even more effective for our specific audience? 
Um, yeah, I think that's like kind of a tool answer, but not really. Uh, another tool that we use is Civi CRM, which is an open source CRM tool. And I think it's pretty powerful. Um, I've worked with, you know, like every single CRM out there and it does pretty much everything you could, you could ask of a CRM it does. And I think leaning into the power of that tool is important because um, you can, as a fundraiser, I kind of fall into a trap of having a million spreadsheets that are all disparate and don't, you know, this information is not talking to the rest of the data that I have. And it's so important to keep track of when you're contacting people and what kind of actions they take afterwards without actually tracking your users, you know, like what action did I take and did they make a donation soon after that? Or did they unsubscribe from the newsletter right after I sent it? Um, so that information is important and I think it can help understand where efforts would be meaningful or where efforts are not, you're not seeing a return. That's yeah, great, thank you. Yep, go jump in. Jump. Yeah, I think that Katarina mentioned something like this uh, as well. I mean, I have this in my notes, like you, 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 have some, you have some small budget to test new ideas, no, from time to time. And for us, it was a bit the same, like, the amount of um, time and money that we invested in the process, in the process, in the end, it's it's comparable to like uh, an OTF grant, no, that you might or might not have, and so like apply kind of the design and agile uh, methodologies to say, okay, what is the smallest thing, the smallest investment I can do to make sure this is going in the right direction, and if it's going in the right direction, I'm going to put more, no, and you can do this. I mean. We're all doing fundraisers uh, every year, so you can do this one year after the other. I know that during the summer, July, August, I'm going to be working on small improvements to this to prepare the next fundraiser, and I have the rest of the year to work on big, bigger grants. So it's also like in terms of scheduling and testing things and starting small. But I wanted to learn more about like Katarina when you when you said you you had budgets to test uh, new ideas and stuff. Like what what kind of ideas do you test, and how do you know whether you should uh, continue with them? So it's actually this year is going to be the first one when we are implementing this idea with this small budget for testing. But if you are, if I should comment about the my previous fundraising life um, at Greenpeace. Um, so for example, in Slovakia, we used it for trying out a new fundraising tool if that is going to uh, work or we bought some specific, I shouldn't tell that on a conference like RightsCon, but we bought like some specific, you know, database of uh, contacts uh, to test the direct mailings. So it was for, for different ideas. And really the nice thing was that there was not the pressure that you also have to earn the money back, which was, uh, which was invested. Uh, um, with this testing budget we have uh, for uh, for this year, so I would like to explore the possibilities of the non-targeted advertisement. Uh, we would like to invest maybe a little bit more and to cooperate with external graphic designer and to have more attractive visuals for the fundraising uh, campaigns and um, what we we were not very strong. What we were not really like using before very much was storytelling in fundraising, which is so important also to bring all the emotions to the fundraising. So we would like to try uh, this as well. So there are a lot of ideas. The budget is limited. <laughs> so we will see. But um, I hope that this idea will survive and we will have it uh, in the, yeah, we can have it also in the next year because it's really important in fundraising, the testing. Maybe I can also comment on the tools uh, we are using. So we have the CVCRM, which is a great help, not only for storing all the contacts for the donors, but as Al said, we are also like writing their uh, comments about meeting the funders and what was the meeting about. So also your colleagues and our colleagues can see what, what was happening. Um, we are using a Swiss donation platform. It's called uh, Raise Now. 
So this we are we have uh, installed on uh, our website. The donation platform was awarded as the best fundraising tool, I think, two or three years um, ago. Um, we are going to, as I have mentioned, we will start with the uh, crypto fundraising uh, from September on, and we are going to use the Trezor uh, hardware wallet and uh, this tool for the for the cryptocurrency fundraising. And we are currently also trying to find a new project management system software, which should be helpful as well. We used to uh, we were using before Open Atrium, but I think this um, product stopped uh, updating the uh, the software, so we are trying to find uh, something else. Yeah, I'll just add a closing remark um, as well. So I guess it's an old tired adage, but you need to spend money to make money. So you need to be cognizant of that and, uh, when building a new team. And it really is a new team. You know, you can't just all, over over a day, over a month, I'm starting to realize even over a year, you know, turn a nonprofit into also, uh, you know, a commercial entity. So you need to hire people with that expertise. You need to you know, you need to come back, I guess, to earth sometimes and realize that we live in a Google world. And uh, if you want to be there, you know, you have to participate. You have to, you know, use their tools um, to sometimes buy their ads as well, you know, as much as <laughs> like that. Um, however, like uh, as Alan Katerina mentioned, you know, there are good tools coming out of our community as well that uh, we can utilize without selling ourselves out and more importantly in selling ourselves out selling our users or potential users out as well um cbcrm has mentioned um we have installed and run uh, matomo analytics which can be an on-premise hosted solution kind of helping you understand you know the analytics of visitation on your website without sharing everything with a third party to do the service for you. Um, another thing which we are trying at the moment, and I really like uh, this turn of events, is having uh, partnerships with other nonprofit technology providers around the world and kind of selling each other's services through each other. So mutually beneficial partnerships that actually help both parties grow. Um, this is to me, you know, what com community is about as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you everybody for sharing. Uh, we are almost getting to the end. I just want to, oh, do you mind talking for like maybe just a couple of minutes because people were asking about the NFT and talking about experimentation. I think uh, if you can share for a couple of minutes a little bit about that and then we can close the panel if you don't mind. Sure, sure. Um, so Earlier this year, we saw our friends Freedom of the Press Foundation have a really successful experience auctioning off an NFT, which was a piece of art um, surrounding Edward Snowden's whistleblowing. And we saw that our community was really engaged in that auction and that the people who donate to Tor were very excited about this. So we decided to sort of like what we've been talking about, we decided to take a risk and do an experiment. And um, we, we spent a little bit of money to do this experiment. You know, it cost us about $5,000, this experiment's worth of money to put on this NFT auction. And we raised about $2 million overall in 24 hours through this auction. And it was something that we had no idea if it was gonna be successful. We really didn't know what the results were gonna be. We saw that our friends had accomplished something really awesome. And we saw that our audience was responding. And I think those are the two main points is that we saw the people in our community were really excited about this. And we said, if these folks are excited about this, we could probably do one for ourselves and have at least uh, make back the money that we've spent on it. 
And it was far more successful than any of us were really imagining, I think, or could have expected. Um, I think another big thing about this is we really leaned on uh, everybody in that community teaching us about how to make this possible. We asked for a lot of advice. We had a lot of calls. We made a lot of decisions um, based on the experience of others. So I think really leaning on our community to learn about what worked and what didn't work made that successful. Um, I'm like about to tear up because it was just so cool to see something like that come out of three weeks of really scrambled hard work and for it to be successful beyond our wildest dreams, you know, to raise a third of our budget in 24 hours was just like mind blowing. And I think it was a good lesson in that you do, you have to spend money to make money. And sometimes you have to take a risk and like, listen to the gut feeling like this is going to resonate with our people because we know our people. We have been interacting with them for years. We see them every day on Twitter. We, you know, talk to our community constantly. And sometimes you just know like this moment is the right moment to, to, to take this effort, to take this risk. And it very well could have not worked out, but it did. And yeah, I don't know. Now I'm rambling. <laughs> no, that's great. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, that's it. Uh, I will pass the mic to Sajolita. Go, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I've been talking about tools, about testing. Uh, Dimitri mentioned like partnership and stuff. And I found this panel so interesting because of the different approaches and stuff. And I was wondering like, what other spaces or what other tools can we give uh, ourselves to share more about these things and stuff? I remember when I did my first fundraiser for Tales, I looked at the, the Wikipedia, you know, Wikimedia reports about their fundraising and stuff, but they explained some of the methodology, some of the tests that they did. And I found like lots of interesting ideas in there. And I'm wondering like how we can, I don't know, like build more spaces for to exchange these ideas and these, uh, okay, this didn't work, this worked and stuff. A hundred percent. That's why I, I like I, I thought this panel was important, right? Like I think uh, us sharing our struggle is the way you know the others can pick up idea. Here I see on the comments that the panel people are like, oh, this is great share like of idea and this things like that. Uh, I want to create more uh, forums like this to work. I think the internet freedom community should come together, you know, like do our own thing. We like we don't need a lot of uh, infra. We just like uh, put it like a uh, three, uh, I don't know, slots on a week, you know, like, and have those slots where people come in and uh, share and there we go, you know, you have like a week of event where the internet freedom community are sharing tactics and things about fundraising, you know, and supporting each other. But I feel like this is just like a quick informal way of getting that kickoff. We could invest more on even like, like you said, organizing uh, transparency reports about our own experience, right? Like Wikipedia said, we can create a repository of tools and documentations and uh, to be, you know, out there shared to others because it, it is a learning curve and like we have like a set of diverse uh, experience here. I feel like uh, doing more sharing about it, uh, the knowledge, the better for others who are, you know, like also struggling. So um, we have one minute to go to, so I really want to thank you all of you who came to this panel, this crazy panel, and share your experience was, uh, you know, transparent and really uh, a lot of knowledge, a lot of great ideas. I hope people who are watching got, uh, you know, like a little bit of that and keep in touch with us and we can share more in the future. So thank you, everybody. <laughs>